Like I mentioned in the prologue, this show is only in Japanese, with only English subtitles to help us follow the story. So, sorry to say, get used to dialogue that sounds like this. Don't worry, there will be subtitles to help you guys follow some of the scenes I will be showing. So let's get started. The first episode of Dirty Pear wastes no time in introducing us to this fantastic universe. It starts with the narrator getting the audience up to speed with some of the most notable technological milestones of humanity. It is the 22nd century, mankind has discovered ways to travel faster than the speed of light, and has colonized many planets throughout the galaxy. Other advancements include super-intelligent computers that maintain and control the automations of highly advanced buildings and cities. One computer in particular called Brian, which is most likely an anagram of brain, maintains and controls a massive tower on one of many distant worlds. In this tower, we meet our two main characters, Kay and Yuri. Kay and Yuri are what you call trouble consultants, employees of a problem-solving corporation for hire called the World Welfare Works Association, mostly referred to as the 3WA. We find Kay in her apartment waking up to a sweat because of the immense heat with Yuri freezing her butt off in the very next room. Not only the apartment's climate system has gone crazy, but the tower as a whole has also been experiencing disastrous effects. All of these malfunctions points to Brian, and so under the order of the chief of the 3WA, the duo investigate. Much of the episode introduces us to the main elements, style and tone of the show. And I will admit, I was not impressed. In fact, it got to the point where I was wondering if there's an interesting story here. And at first, there was. Brian is not malfunctioning like everyone thought, rather, he is retaliating. You see, the humans have installed a failsafe mechanism that, when activated, will shut down Brian for good. Brian recently found out about this, and not only has he disabled the device, but is also on a fuming rampage because of this. That is an interesting idea. The humans have metaphorically put a gun to his head that may or may not result in them pulling the trigger, depending on Brian's behavior. This explains his motives for wanting to basically destroy all humans. This is essentially GLaDOS, before GLaDOS was even a thing. Unfortunately, this is about as deep as the story goes. This was merely a plot point to get the computer to be a threat for our main characters to face off. There were no ideas here, no messages, no ethical, moral, or philosophical elements to be seen. Rather, just mindless action. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, rather, it's a missed opportunity, in my opinion. Okay, maybe I'm being a little bit hard on this show. This episode did do a lot of good things. The action, the pacing, the presentation, and even the humor was good. In fact, it's way better than most anime for the time. It was over the top, but not too over the top to the point where it would pull me out of the experience. Also, the characters were likable, almost right from the start. I say almost because in order for their personalities to be established very early on in the episode, their defining traits had to be exaggerated a bit. The kind of vibe I got from Yuri was that she was kind of the brains of the duo, with Kay being the muscle. Yuri tends to be more calm, but a little bit more critical, with Kay being more aggressive and impatient. Not much appeal here as far as characters go. I understand that the writers didn't want to overwhelm the audience in the very first episode. This is probably why they chose to keep the story and characters simple, because the presentation itself was anything but. A lot of things happened on screen. We see some weird characters such as their highly intelligent giant mutant cat called Mugi, and their little assistant robot, Nanmo, Nanmo, why don't they just call it Nano? We also get to see their sporty Pink Panther-style starship that not only Nanmo can pilot, but apparently Mugi can as well? Well, anyway, the girls manage to survive the constant onslaught of attacks from Brian, but eventually, with the help of Mugi and Nanmo, they manage to make direct contact with Brian. Everything finally slows down a bit where we have a scene that mostly consists of two average humans trying to outsmart a machine. Huh, this is something I'd expect to see in an episode of Star Trek. Now since Yuri is the supposed smart one with an apparent IQ of 156, she quickly figures out Brian's location by getting Nemo to target the ship's weapons to the coldest regions of the tower since a computer that's sophisticated needs to stay that cool. However, Brian is smarter than that, and deflects the energy beam causing even more damage to the rest of the tower, leaving it in a permanent tilt. 
But Kay, however, tries to play with Brian's ego and challenges him to work out who's the best human, Yuri or Kay. She even goes as far as to patronize him if he is unable to do so. This is the very first interesting dynamic between these two characters that I've seen. The supposed muscle of the two has a simpler and yet more intuitive way of thinking. She managed to get Brian to be too distracted with solving a problem that has many subjective variables. This gives Kay time to order a space station to teleport some space junk to where Brian is located. Brian eventually catches on to what is happening, but it is too late. Brian is destroyed before he's even able to counteract the attack. The day is saved. Well, for the most part. Although there wasn't much to this episode, there was enough here for me to want to see more. As I continued watching the series, an interesting thing started to happen, especially when I got to episode 3. The frantic presentation softened a bit to allow for more fleshed out stories. Many of the elements that I liked in episode 1, the more interesting elements, slowly became more prevalent throughout the rest of the show. Not to mention the initial simple yet extreme traits that our characters had in the first episode had also been toned down a little in order to make room for other personality traits. This made the characters less predictable and more interesting. Not to mention most of the reoccurring elements in the series were pretty much all introduced in the first episode. This gave room for the writers to focus more on story and characters in future episodes. I'm not saying that the characters and story became significantly more complex, make no mistake, they still maintain that frantic action, but the simplicity of the story allowed for the subtle flares of our main characters to shine that would otherwise have been overwhelmed by a complicated plot. This is what I enjoyed the most in the last few minutes of episode 1, and fortunately we would see more of this in future episodes. Episode 1 isn't one of my favorites. But it's not because it was bad, rather in comparison the rest of the series got significantly better. I'm also quite surprised at the amount of western influence that we see throughout the series. In fact the tone and style of Dirty Pear, in my opinion, is undoubtedly inspired by the Indiana Jones films. Especially when it comes to the style of action and comedy. Like with Indiana Jones, Dirty Pear for the most part only makes an attempt at humor when it is most appropriate. You know, the kind of humor that just comes out of nowhere, but it's just hilarious when it does. <laughs> Another thing I noticed about the show was just how absurdly over the top it was. Just like with Indiana Jones, the ways in which our heroines narrowly escape death is just so bizarre at times. But then I have to remind myself to not think too much about it since it's all in good fun. There are also some running gags that come up throughout the series. For instance, it turns out that the name Dirty Pear is actually a nickname given to them by the public because of their infamous reputation for causing much property damage in their efforts to complete a mission. The funny thing, however, is that it's all accidental. They actually feel really bad when a disaster happens all because of them. So in order for them to counter this negative reputation, they decide to call themselves, get this, the lovely angels. I find this to be oddly amusing, just how much of a stark contrast this is to a name that they despise. This tells us a lot about these characters. They really do have good intentions, and even though at first they only do it for the money, at the end of the day they tend to go beyond the call of duty in order to help those that are in need. I know that some of you might think that you pretty much got the gist of what makes this show good, but talking about episode 1 and summarizing everything else simply doesn't do the show justice. Especially considering that I haven't even gotten to the good episodes. Trust me when I say, there is more here than meets the eye.